I sang that song for more than 60 years, a song of praise to Joseph Smith, the prophet of the restoration and founder of the LDS Church, the church I served as a bishop for five years. I knew the church was true. I was a faithful Latter-day Saint. My life has been built on certain truths, but wishing doesn't change the truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. When I finally learned the truth about the real history and doctrines of Mormonism, I realized that I was following the gospel of Joseph Smith and not the gospel of Jesus Christ. I have come to learn that many others have made a similar journey out of the bondage of religion and into an authentic relationship with Jesus. And that's what this show is all about. Courageous people who want to share their story, hoping that you, the viewer, will discover the same new life in Jesus. So if you're a Latter-day Saint who is struggling with questions or seeking a genuine encounter with the Savior, we invite you to join us tonight. We have a joyful message that we want to share with you. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Ex-Mormon Files. I'm your host, Bishop Earl, and I appreciate you joining us. Again, we're in Boise, Idaho, Meridian, Idaho, I guess it is, and uh, actually in the shadows of the New Meridian Temple. How, how interesting. But uh, anyway, last time we got to visit Victoria Bringhurst, and today we get to visit with Sam Bringhurst, her husband. And she's just a delightful young lady, and we learned at the very end she's pregnant yep. and uh, with your second child, and yep. I hope that's okay to go public with that. Sure is. Is yep. it too late now? No, it's, <laughs> hey, it's all right. Or whatever public is in that case. But <laughs> that's all right. Anyway, she's just a delightful lady and, and such an interesting story, and of course she mentioned you a few times, mm -hmm. and so we'll get to hear a little bit more about that. But were you always uh, from Idaho? Were yeah, you I was here? actually born in Kimberly, Idaho. My mom had a middle. Where's Kimberly? From? It's just a suburb of Twin, just of I think Twin southeast Falls. of Twin Falls. Okay. Yeah. So yeah. And were there actually Twin Falls? Is that which um, one it was named? Yeah, after? I guess there's the Twin Falls, but Shoshone Falls is the is, is the, the one that falls. most people visit. Yeah. That's the big the big daddy. Okay. It's pretty cool. So yeah. bigger than the Idaho Falls. Quite a bit. Yeah, quite it's, a bit. it's quite a bit different. <laughs> yep. Anyway, it's pretty country up here. It so is. I yep. Guess you've loved Idaho and. Yeah, it's a good place to yeah. be with family, yeah. raise a family. It's yeah. it's nice and calm. Your folks were they active members of the church? Very and, much so. Yep. Yeah. Generational. I mean. The, yeah. Goes back a while. Um, were yeah. they converts? Yeah, my my dad comes back. So the Bringhurst name is you've probably heard some oh, in Utah. Oh, I've heard many Bringhurst. So, in fact, my uh, my high school t teacher was, or not teacher, but principal was a Bringhurst. Yeah. Anyway, go ahead. Yeah, it's <laughs> it's pretty prevalent. Um, so my I'm actually named after my grandpa, who was named after my great grandpa Samuel Enoch Bringhurst, who was. The oh, first temple president of the Swiss Temple. Oh boy! Um, back in nineteen. Really, back in the day, he was. He, I think they lived in Murray. He was pretty high up there in the church, as far as I know. A couple of missions for the early church. Mm. Mission president, I think, as well. Northwestern states. Wow! So the name goes back. It's the name Sam goes back to. It's pretty prevalent in my my family, in especially. Yeah. And in fact, if you I don't know if you recall, but there's a Mormon uh, video, older tape called uh, "How Pre How Rare a Possession" oh, about sure. Fr Francesca. Yeah, the, find the finds the Book of Mormon in the garbage you'll hear, can or you'll something? You'll hear you'll hear Samuel Enoch Bringhurst's name, who is the man that baptized him. He he actually oh, baptized that guy. That? So it goes back. There's some history okay. there, but but that's my dad's side, yeah. very much so. And then my mom, um, my mom, uh, not so much. I mean, I think her parents were pretty active, sort yeah. of. And then I think at the end of both of their, to the words the end of both of their lives, they, I, I would say they were semi-inactive, especially my okay. grandfather, but she was her. always very staunch. I'd yeah. say probably the staunch one in the family. Okay. Brothers and sisters, do you have? Yeah, I'm the middle of five, two older sisters, two younger brothers. Okay. So being uh, baptized at eight, I guess, mm -hmm. and lived the normal Mormon life, primary and yeah. Sunday school and all that stuff. Very much, and, you know, yeah. Priesthood, you went to the yeah. Ronic priesthood. Yeah, I was so. pretty, um, in my town I was I think I was in a lot of ways uh, kind of idolized. I was very staunch, very, um, <laughs> very strictly Mormon. Good, I was I was boy, the yeah. I was the guy to reference for poster child. Poster child. Um, 
And a lot of that came within from within myself. Nobody really put a lot of pressure, I would say, other than what's standard in the church. church but, yeah. but I put a lot of pressure on myself. Um, pretty perfectionist-driven kind of guy. And then yeah. at 15 years old, I um, really started to... I went through a really big bout of depression, really bad. Um, as a young teenager? As about 15 years old. I think it was a sophomore in high school. It came from a combination of, like I said, myself, schooling, me trying to be perfect and everything, and then the church as well. Really? Which I look back now and I realize it was probably the primary thing. The church that, was. Because I think that, yeah. So. Did at 14 <clears throat> you ever have a sense that you wanted to experience what Joseph Smith experienced? Did you? Did that oh yeah, come? I definitely felt like that a lot. Did you? I remember praying in, when I was pretty young, I'd probably say 10 or 12. I remember praying in my upper bunk bed and like to, to tears, forcing myself to feel a testimony and, yeah. and, a, and a, a, a vision of sorts just approved. Joseph just, could do it, so why exactly, not me? Exactly, yeah. yeah. I definitely had that, you know, yeah. trying to force I myself that into too. that. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. Yeah. So uh, you go through seminary? Did you take seminary? Yeah, or? seminary. My seminary teacher um, told me multiple times, he, he, he was another guy that really like me and thought I, he told me, you know, if anybody I've met can do this, you should be a summer day teacher. I told him I th had some interest in it back then, yeah, and yeah. yeah, I was pretty involved. Yeah. Wow. You know, it's funny when we when we see young people like that, we just have an expectation that they're learning the gospel the same way we adults are. Yeah. And, you know, in other words, when we have a, an emotional moment in sacrament meeting or something, we're assuming that our kids maybe have that same. Uh, emotional mm -hmm. feeling and all that. Did you, did you sense that you had a, a strong testimony of the church? And I think it's kind of that's kind of an interesting question. I think it probably for most Mormons, when they leave, they'll they'll think about that a lot. And for me, it was I do I do feel like I had the, the testimony moments for me. I remember one time in particular listening to a, a gentleman that I really looked up to, a very humble man, um, dealt with a lot of depression too. And he was up in testimony meeting one day. He never was much of a talker, didn't really try yeah. to get attention. But he got up and bore a really beautiful testimony about Jesus that day. And I I felt something on that really? day. I felt like it was a moment of grace for me uh, in, in my youth. And that was big. But again, you always equate things to the church because it's in a church oh, setting. Yeah, proves the testimony church meeting. Right. He probably said something about the church, I'm yeah. assuming. But what I remember was about Jesus, Jesus. and his mercy. and, and to me, what I think is so beautiful about the Bible now when I read it and about Jesus is, is just that he, he, he's a healer. He goes to the broken people. You know, those are his exactly. people. And I've always felt a pull to those type of people um, to right. try to help them or to look at them and hear their story because I, I just, anyway, I think that's really beautiful. Yeah, so, I didn't come for the healthy. I came for yeah, the Yeah, it's just it. all backwards yeah. in the Mormon it church. Is, it is backwards. You have yep. to become healthy to, to be acceptable. Yeah, wash up before you take a shower. Yeah. Yep. Can't yeah, do that. that no point. Yeah. So you end up graduating high school and decide to go on a mission, I guess, yeah. huh? Yeah, I was, yeah, I, um, when it came to, yeah, I mean, I was always sure I was going to go. Yeah. Um, having gone through the depression thing, I think my parents and were myself a little bit were that? a little bit concerned. And yeah. I got um, I called to the Santa Rosa, California mission, which... Was um, closer. Was, was closer, that, so was, I figured that was a part of, because I think it was in my paperwork. If I remember it? I had to be listed, are you on any medication? I was taking some at the time. Oh, okay. So, yeah. So I, they I, kept you stateside. And, and what's funny is the mission itself, the mission president prior to my mission president, apparently the story that I heard from a couple of counselors and the mission nurse, I believe, that I saw mm -hmm. a lot yeah. for those reasons, she told us that the prior mission president who... Um, got a rep for not being a good mission president, didn't have great numbers, but he was, um, the nurse told me one time, he, his calling was to help a lot of um, sick missionaries, uh, depressed missionaries, oh. and, very, uh, and I thought that was interesting that I got called to that got as well. There. But it was really, really more good. In, more inspiration, I'm sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. But anyway, you meet Victoria there. Yeah, so my mission went pretty, so the, when I first got to the MTC, I it was like round two for me as far as bad depression. Um, it, oh, it was really? it was bad. I, in fact, the you night, didn't give up on it though. Yeah, it's an interesting story. I mean, so down the road, so the first night. I mean, I even felt I had. I can never say that I really felt like a kind of like a demonic presence throughout yeah. my life. I'm starting to notice those things now more. But more so. that night, I used to think it. What happened was I. 
I felt I was really depressed, really, um, really feeling like, you know, I need my mom, who I was very attached to yeah. throughout my whole life and really loved her and still do. But <laughs> um, I remember feeling like a presence that night. And I remember hearing stories on the MTC, you're going to be attacked. And I equated it to that because I was, but I, I realize now the missionary experience was the ex, beginning of the exit of the Mormon church for me. For you, interesting. You know, thanks to God. And, yeah. and I remember, I feel like now that was probably what it was. I, if I hadn't gone, I might be there still. But um, the mission experience, as far as how it went for me, it was very difficult, very, very trying. I mean, I, I had it pretty easy. I wasn't walking streets in oh, really? <laughs> any foreign country, but, yeah. you know, got fed every night, had great companions, and mission president was really understanding to my situation, but I just dealt with a lot of, I, I, you know, because the mission, mission experience is kind of like Mormonism times 10 or yeah, 20 oh, or sure, 30. It's yeah. just expounded, and yeah. I just took it so intense, and I just couldn't meet up to it. And yeah. About a year out, my mission president told me, I was a good missionary, served as a district zone leaders. I really, really was, I, I tried so hard, you yeah. know. And trying to be he, the best you could be. Sure. Yeah, at about a year out, he told me that I should, he even kind of almost encouraged me maybe to, to think about going home, you know, just very understanding. Hey, you know, you served, you know, this may be two years for you, um, the one year, you know, it was very hard. Yes. But for some reason I stayed. And then after the year mark is when things started to change for me. In met, what way? Met, so what happens? Yeah, I met Victoria, um, and obviously, as a missionary experience, you're not supposed to hang out with girls, but no. we did. We we spent some time together. Um, had some companions that were um, willing to let like, me do that. And really, really rebellious. Really we walked, sure were. Walked, walked but, the um, edge there. Huh? We yeah. were. We were walking. walking. <clears throat> at that point in my mission and my life, I was kind of at the point of like I was an empty well, and I just was. I just kind of. It's very rare for me to ever give up on things like that yeah. and do things to that extent, but. I think that was the beginning of things for me because I started to feel a contradiction in what the missionary and even the church experience was telling me and leaders and missionaries versus how I felt God was teaching me and telling me what to do at the time. Really? So it wasn't really doctrinal kinds of things or theological or it wasn't historical, I guess, anything of no. the church, uh, negative me, stuff, just a feeling with God and For Jesus. me, it began very much so as a... The church requires so much, so many things to do. And I started to feel in my heart that I just, I, I could not sure. do this. I yeah. cannot. There came a point when I just realized, like, I'm, I'm killing myself from the inside out. And I really was. I was kind of dying, I felt like. My body, my mind, everything was just giving up. That's a great perception at 19, 20, 21. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of a deep that. guy <laughs> to yeah. my detriment sometimes. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, and at that point, again, when I... You know, at the end of my mission, I met with a I met with a counselor a few times, and did that help? Yes, the last one I met with was a game changer for me. She was um, LDS. Yeah, LDS yeah. Family Services. I sure. think you have to visit sure. at a stake center. Right. But one day she told me she said um, she basically just kind of broke things down. We talked about my relationship with my mom and and you know how I feel like I need to impress you know my family and be that for them because I always honestly really was in my opinion I was very much the the rock of the family, the good, spiritually, church-wise. Yeah. And I just had a lot of pressure on myself. And she told me one day in, a, in an interview um, or a counseling session, you know, basically just like, you don't have to keep doing this. And it just kind of finally clicked. And I had this moment of just clarity where I just felt like I do have a choice. And I've always known I have a choice. But now I, I, I'm giving myself the freedom, the freedom to, make that, to make that choice, which wow. was healthy for me. And I, I came home just a few months prior to my mission being over. I think I came home in November versus February. Oh. My mission president at that point was surprised. He, oh, okay, Gee, if you, you want to go home, yeah. sure. But I told him, I'm, I've made my decision. I'm ready to go. Um, so were you through with the church then at that point? No, I wasn't. Okay. I, I was very much through with the mission experience. Right. It burned me bad uh, in my Did opinion. you feel like a hypocrite? I, I did it first, definitely. In the definitely. sense of what you were sharing or how oh, as between far as sharing that, and feeling? Well, I, I was a pretty good missionary by church standards as far as what, what to share, I mean, but I felt... fell along the line of giving the lessons. And, yeah, yeah, I oftentimes felt like I was teaching more about Christ than I was about the church. You sense that? I felt, at, especially towards Whereas the Whereas the church is encouraging you to give the... Yeah, and I think it was kind of subconscious, but I just had this pull to... In fact, right before I left, we had missionary prep classes with my state president. Yeah. And 
I remember going to like EFY and then coming home and getting prepped for my mission and I just had this thought and I just like, you know, I looked at a picture in a testimony meeting one day. Everybody's bearing their testimony about the church and this and this and this and this. Yeah, yeah. And I saw a picture of Jesus on the wall and I just thought to myself like, I just, I've like, it was like I had never had that connection with him and I just, it was like a weird experience where, wow. This is the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and, and none of us talk about him, like especially in our testimony meetings. Right. And, and it just was an epiphany for me. And before I left, I was like, I just felt like I'm going to go out and share about Jesus. And I did believe in the church, and I shared all those sure, things, but sure. that was my focal point. Uh-huh. Now, you've had a born-again moment. Is that, yeah. When did you have that, and what was that? So right when I got back from my mission, I went to BYU-Idaho. We got married right away, um, yeah. very much in love and very much ready to get married. Yeah. A lot of Mormon reasons, too, <laughs> yeah, as you can true. imagine. You know, but <laughs> um, So basically, we got married in the temple, um, and, but it was very quick. Right when I came home, I just started to feel like I don't really feel like going to church. I kind of was exhausted That's again my, was my well was dry just, and I just uh, needed some hard time. time getting him motivated to it go, was it's very to odd church. for me that would it was a very odd thing and I just it just started from there and then right when I got home until a year ago just just about a year ago I'm 26 now it's just amazing I spent about four or five years just just, um, just trying to fill sure. that well back up yeah. with a lot of different things um, you know most of it was just trying to find my place, happiness in the world, people. I felt yeah. a lot better about being with people. Um, just and during this four or five year period, did you, you just probably in the back of your mind felt the church was true, did you? I, I think, you uh, well, so I left. I eventually get back yeah, and she get talked my a little life bit, right. Yeah, she talked a little bit about, sounds like me getting kicked out of school um, well, yeah, because my church attendance you, was not good Yeah, there. you weren't going and so. Yeah, I had yeah. a job at BYU Idaho and doing full time, I think 3.5 GPA as a good student, but I just, my, at that point, I was really, I did not like the church and a lot of its social things and yeah. the constraints. And I just, I didn't really think I had detached from the doctrinal side yeah. and I hadn't delved into material, but myself was just so despondent from it. And um, it took until last year till I actually stumbled upon Matt Slick's radio station. Oh, yeah. I, we moved to Boise for my job, right. um, at job here, um, January of 2016. And I'm in the car a lot, and I, I just stumbled across him talking to a young Mormon kid one day. And actually, it was a pretty, you know, arrogantly, as you can imagine, kid trying to prove Matt Slick wrong, who he's pretty theological, theologically sound yeah. about Jesus. And it took me, I started listening to that, and I started to look at his website and see things. One of the deal breakers for me is we still had the quad, I think you call it, in our house. Sure. And I looked at the book of Abraham, and that just blew me away. I just looked in the book compared to a video and some research and was like, this prophet lied. He did not have the translative power. This is a joke, actually, yeah. what he said it was. And, and those facsimiles that are facsimiles, identical between the Pearl of Great Price. The white head drawn on a yeah. black sphinx body. Exactly. It just, it was kind of, I had to, I, at that point, as far as some of the church stuff, I had to make a decision. This was about a year ago. All right, I could at this point do what I used to do, put this on the shelf, or I can take what I'm seeing and I'm taking God's <laughs> continued things he's given me here and I can just accept it. And, yeah. and I think that's what I've noticed uh, as a Christian, born again Christian now, I'm realizing that it's all about putting yourself down and putting God up and just realizing, you know, there is things above me I don't understand, I can't understand, but yeah. I'm going to trust in him. And I think that's what Mormons sometimes won't do. They will just trust in their feelings and in their yeah. church instead. And there's a freedom to that, isn't there, that to, to give it all to Christ. and. To it's true freedom. It's, yeah. it's the absolute most pure form of freedom. So. Well, I guess I don't think I missed it, but did you actually the born again yeah, moment? Yeah, I'll share it with that, you. Okay. Sorry. I'm sorry. If, uh, and I jab a lot, so you'll no, have to no. forgive me. But, um, <coughs> so I was listening to Matt's uh, experience of his last time going down to Manti, and he was basically this, this night. Right, Manti pageant. Manti pageant. So I had... I, that night, I, just another night of me just sitting around. I think I had had a few beers, and, and I remember just sitting there just listening to it. It was a kind of a comforting thing for me to hear this new Jesus and this, this the understanding that the church really was, a, it was fake, as a joke, as a counterfeit. Yeah. And um, he, told, he was talking about how he was explaining to this woman at the pageant these things, the scriptures, the Bible, versus what you ho- choose to hold on and things they don't even understand about their history or know. Yeah. And he said the phrase to the effect of, she kept trampling the word of God under her feet. And 
I just, it just kind of, I don't attribute it to anything I did. I don't, I, I'm pretty reformed in my thinking now, but um, <laughs> I feel like what, hap what happened was I literally just had this feeling just crush me. I, it just, I literally got on my knees. Victoria's been Christian. I feel like the Mormons never could quite a break her over Christianness. And yeah. um, I used to see her at a Christian, we'd go to a Christian concert. I think it was so weird when she'd and other people raise their hands and praise God. I just yeah. didn't understand that. Right. And um, I literally was forced on my knees by God and I started After doing that. This trampling thing. Yeah. I, I raised my hands up and I started just praying out loud. I was kind of nervous because she was sitting on the couch at first. I started praying and I was like, and I felt like he was telling me what to pray. And wow. the thing he told me to say was he told me to beg for forgiveness of thinking I could become a God one day. And wow. it just kept coming out of my, my mouth, of, please, Lord, forgive me for my arrogance. You are God. You are true. And, and I, I praise you. Things like that you don't hear from a Mormon because they don't no. worship a God. If they worshiped right. him, they would praise him. They worship themselves. Yeah. They put Jesus as a means to an end to becoming their own yeah. God. And they, when they leave, they think it's everything's a lie. A lot of people turn atheists, but they don't realize that they've encountered a counterfeit. Right. There is a real thing. Yeah. They just were lied to, and they, Isn't it's it? terrible. But that was my experience. I, I was literally just forced to my knees, did things I never could imagine doing, and I had an experience that I, I've, it's changed a lot of things. And you in can't my life. deny it once it happens. Yeah, you, and it's nothing. Your like, eyes open and your heart's yep. softened and. And there's such a freedom and joy in that. True freedom. And I just feel like I was sharing with one of my friends recently or a while ago about what I really feel like what this life is about now. And I feel like this life is really about submitting and submitting to a, a infinite and holy God. You know, not yeah. submitting to our own wills, our own understanding, our own circumstances, jobs, yeah. and, family even. And what I can do to get to celestial kingdom exactly. or anything. We just praise his name. We give him thanks and we, and we realize there is somebody in control, and it's not us. And we need to we need to give it all to and him. recognize that. Recognize, sure, yeah. yeah. Wow. So was this difficult for the family to? Yeah. Do we shared that with them? And yeah, my relationship with my family has been strained for quite some time. A lot of it has to do with my wife and myself, and just a lot of family differences. Um, but. When it comes to that, yeah, I actually was able to share with my mom. We had a phone call pretty soon after, before or after that happened, I can't remember, but I was telling her about things like in the temple, like the temple veil was ripped, you know, God finished it on. You never heard that as a Mormon, did I you? I had heard, had you? I had heard something about the veil, you know, we talked, but the, the veil is a different veil in the Mormon, right, it's a veil right. over your eyes, but, yeah, yeah. and I think that's interesting as well. I feel like the devil very much, Isn't he, so he tweaks every yeah. single thing. Gethsemane instead of cross, right. um, this and that, veil, this instead of that, veil yeah. this and not veil. Like he's literally taken, again, he's counterfeited actual things and he's Use the to twist same them. words, but just don't. Yeah, it's, yeah. Um, but yeah. So you shared that with her? I shared that say? with her. I, sh I shared that about the temple and some things I'd been researching and she actually, she kind of listened, which was interesting. <laughs> She's, again, if you, if you think of your person in your life right now that's Mormon and they'll never, ever, ever leave, yeah. that's her. and. Um, but maybe you had some good conversations seat, though, with huh? her though. Hope, um, pray that she things will continue to be yeah, shed light maybe, on her eyes. But maybe she'll listen to this uh, oh, message yeah. that you're yeah, sharing. I'm sure. I'm Dean hoping so. Victorious and and uh, the heart that you have for God and yeah. and what He's done for us. Yeah. Yeah. We didn't understand. I didn't understand grace, and you certainly didn't teach that on your mission. I'm sure. Nope. <laughs> didn't know what it was. Yeah. And the Bible, of, I guess that's taken a different uh, turn for you. Did you study it much as a Mormon? Did you? Yeah. I mean, we selected out scriptures. Yeah, right? I think I I tried to study a lot, but I I I, I didn't do as good as I could have. Um, but I definitely with the Bible, you mean? Or? With the Bible and with the Book of oh, Mormon, but I I definitely read the Book of Mormon more. Sure. But I uh, I didn't reverence the Bible at all like I do yeah. now. Like I I understand it as yeah. complete, whole, and well, sufficient. <laughs> yeah. Did, when sharing with your family, was there anything you'd do differently now that you've, or are you still in that process of sharing with family? Yeah, I'm, I feel like I'm in the thick of it right now. Oh, yeah. um, and especially for me, is it's tough because I was, for five years, I literally was in a very humanistic and um, kind of almost, almost agnostic atheist. Does times. your family know that? I mean, do they know you struggled? 
I think, to come to Christ? I think so. I think a little bit. They do um, now, I hope. They do now. But, <laughs> but I mean, um, that's true of a lot of Mormons. Yeah, and struggle. we've talked about it, and maybe too much uh, repeating, but just that they're not anchored in Jesus. When, they, when you find out the true church isn't true, yep. you end up leaving and you don't have Jesus to, to really fall and back on. And it's a on. proof for Mormonism being completely false because if you find out the truth of it, yeah, and then you would you would still stay if you find out the truth in Mormonism, you leave and you you hate it. You never want to go back. You know. Well, yeah, and you just so, the bottle the, the the genie's out of the bottle, so to yeah. speak. You can't kind of put it back. And, yeah, but I've just I've noticed um, coming to the true Jesus coming, and that's why Mormons hate hearing that we believe in Jesus. But if yeah, they, they say did, they're Christian, if they did, they? things would be so different. And for me, having experienced both sides and the in between of disbelief. I just, it's just all to, you know, God, God is, he's so much more than we can fathom, but yet he meets us on, on a level where we can recognize his holiness on this earth. Yeah. And we just have to be willing to accept it. As a Mormon, it's hard to because you put your church in that role instead of Jesus. And, yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah. Well, that scripture of uh, in John where it says, He that believeth in me hath everlasting life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for an LDS, that, it's just much more complicated than that. Yes, it is. And they, they misunderstand that. Don't you think they misunderstand what uh, yep. this free, or, well, they call it cheap grace, but just that you now can go do anything you want? Yeah, 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 that's a misconception too. Yeah. And you know, you, and we do have freedom in Christ now, but we don't. But the difference is when you meet, when you find, when you, when Jesus meets you, yeah. you start to love Him and you start to live for Him, mm -hmm. and your life slowly kind of gets cleaned up. And and again, the, clean to a Christian in my mind is a lot different than clean to a Mormon. And Jesus Himself, you know, He was accused. He says, you know, I come. I'm going to misquote a Bible here, but he, he's come, a son of man comes eating and drinking, and they call him a drunkard wine, and a glutton. Wine bibber, yeah. And he just proves right there, you know, he didn't spend his time in a building with white shirts and ties <laughs> and arrogant um, yeah. egos. He spent his time yeah. in, in the darkest, deepest holes with the most sinful creatures because yeah. that's who he came to save. And if they are willing to believe, that's all he yeah. needs. That's all he needs. That's neat. Well, gosh, we've only got about a half a minute. Anything quickly that you'd say to your family? Uh, to anybody, I'd say don't discount truth because you've been hurt. Seek after truth because it's real. Yeah. Yep. Read the Bible. I think that's a, Yeah, read the Bible. Trust in and, Jesus. Yeah. yeah, read the Bible. is huge. You're, all the truth will come to you, to yeah, you through it's that. It's the Word of God. And we just didn't appreciate that as LDS, did we? Yep. Yeah, it was just kind of that extra book in the quad that we carried around and yep. had a few scriptures here and there. Well, Sam, thanks so yeah. much. What a wonderful story. And gosh, aren't you thrilled to be on this journey now? Yep. Yeah, good to be on the right team. Yeah. <laughs> thanks for joining us. See ya.